so um, we'll talk about spondylitis, when and how uh, surgery is indicated, and kind of try and go through these things. We'll kind of spend a brief amount of time on, on the first two and kind of spend a little bit more, actually we'll spend a fair bit of time on natural history because I think it's kind of fascinating uh, with regards to spondylitis and what actually happens here. So uh, first of all, everybody knows what it is. Uh, it's a defect in the pars interarticularis of the vertebral arch. And if we look at these pictures down here, um, we can kind of see exactly where that would be um, on this model here. Um, when we look at the incidence, the incidence overall is about 4.2 percent. Um, these two gentlemen in 1951 looked at 4,200 cadavers and, and figured this out. However, when we break it down across um, different sorts of people, we have the African Americans with 1.1 uh, to 2.8 percent, depending on males versus females. And in the Caucasians, we have uh, 2.3 to 6.4 percent. When we look at the Eskimos and the Inuits, they can go as high as 20 to 25 percent. So it kind of varies across uh, different people. Interestingly, um, two to three times more common in males and females. Uh, usually presents in adolescence um, is when the symptoms present, although it's usually thought that the actual insult occurred probably earlier than that. Um, and this is when they become symptomatic. 85 to 95 percent occur at L5. Uh, L4 is the next most common area where it occurs. The other interesting thing is that um, for people who do not walk, uh, people who are CP, people who are wheelchair bound, they never have this and they never found a newborn uh, with spondylolysis. Uh, so it's actually something that occurs in us and is thought to be due to us being upright, whereas they don't really see it in, in chimpanzees and uh, other primates. Um, this is a study uh, that came out in 2003 in the Spine Journal, but I think is a, a really good study uh, done by Butler. And basically, it started back, um, it's a 45-year uh, a follow-up, and they found 500 first graders that they took x-rays of, and they followed them to age 50, and they've kind of been tracking this around. Maybe some of you know this article and have followed it along. They basically found that of the 500 first graders, 22 had a lytic defect at age 6, and then they uh, were able to identify an additional 8 that occurred between, 20, between 12 and 25 years of age, kind of as they tracked these people out. 22 of them out of, the, um, out of the 30 had bilateral L5, 8 had unilateral, and never slipped. Of the 22 with the lytic defect at age 6, spondylolisthesis never developed in 4, and the average slip angle was 11 degrees, or 11 percent, pardon me, of uh, the, the vertebral uh, body. In the additional uh, eight people between 12 and 25 years, uh, one never slipped, one slipped 10 percent, two slipped 20 percent, and two slipped 30 percent. Of these uh, 30 people out of this 500 group, only three patients had surgery, and this was essentially unrelated to the lysis. There was one of those patients that actually had a fusion, but this was not done for that. And when they studied that patient, he actually developed a pseudarthrosis, but was uh, essentially asymptomatic. The conclusions from their study was that uh, when they kind of looked at this, is that the prognosis follows that of the general population. The onset of the slip did not occur with pain. The incidence of symptomatic slip progression with bilateral L5 PARS defects is about 5%. And then the, the question that kind of comes from this is which comes first? Uh, does it start? So you have a spondylolysis. Uh, does that then lead to degenerative disc disease? Does that then lead to a slip that then causes the symptoms? I think it's important to break down the difference between that that occurs in adults, those over about age 12, pardon me, those over about age 20 to 25, versus those that occur in adolescence, because they're a very different, um, different group of people. Most often, if you are dealing with spondylolysis, it's going to present an adolescent, and it's thought that a slip occurs with the growth spurt. Um, in adolescents that present with back pain, about 35% of those will have spondylolysis when you kind of come up with your final diagnosis. Many of them you won't have a diagnosis on. And with your workup, you want to think x-rays, uh, plus or minus obliques to try and visualize that, bone scan and CT scan. In an adult, those over 20 to 25, if they, have, they may have a spondylolysis, but this is not going to be the source of their pain. There's something else going on here that's causing the pain. So again, I think the key thing is we have to differentiate these people into the group, two groups. We have the adolescents and we have the adults, and those are, will have very different treatments. First of all, with the adolescents, in those that you diagnose with having a spondylolysis, bone scan is hot, x-rays show it, um, those that are symptomatic, 80 to 90 percent of these will be successful without surgery. You treat these with rest, meaning kind of a change from their sporting activities. Uh, I may treat them with a, a TLSO or HTLSO uh, or some sort of brace and physical therapy. And if you look at the various studies, about 80 to 90 percent of people will get better and never need surgery. In the adult, it's a different group of people, and you, they may have a spondylolysis, 
but again, you're not really treating the spondylolysis, you're treating what else is going on with it, whether that's a spondylolisthesis that's developed or whether they've developed degenerative disc disease, and whether that's related to the spondylolysis or not is relatively unclear. Well, then we have to decide when is surgery indicated. Um, so first of all, the main indications we want to think about is if they have a progressive slip. So again, you're not treating the spondylolysis, you're treating somebody who happens to have a spondylolysis but then has also developed a spondylolisthesis and are slipping. How much before you, you fuse, I think that's variable. Those with intractable pain, those with neurological deficits, and those with failed bracing over six months. Largely the last group pertains to the adolescents. So again, most of these adolescents will get better and you don't want to jump into their backs right away. There's basically five main types of surgical techniques that have been described. There's the Scott's technique uh, described in 87, the Buck's technique described in 70, Morsher's technique in 84, and then a screw hook combination of pedicle screw fusions. These are basically, if you look at uh, the studies that have been done regarding to spondyloly spondylolysis and treatment of it, these are the studies, and you can see that most of them are relatively small, um, and this has been shifted a little bit, but you can see that the large studies have 75 patients, 37 patients, and 33 patients, so no huge, huge studies, but 75 is pretty good. And you can see that the successful outcomes with the various techniques are relatively good, ranging somewhere in the 80% range to 90% range. So here's one type of technique that's described in the literature called a Scott wiring. Um, you basically take an 18-gauge stainless steel wire, wrap it around the transverse processes bilaterally, and then around the spinous process to try and get this compressed and reduced. In one of the larger studies done with this technique, which consists of only 14 patients with a 10-year follow-up, all under the age of 25 years, 12 did excellent or well, and two did poorly. Um, in the study by uh, Debnath et al. Uh, in 2003, two out of their three developed a non-union, and three out of the three that they did did not return to their sports. So this is uh, one technique, uh, again, kind of came out earlier, and so before some of our modern day fixation, but this is uh, something that's used. The more uh, commonly described one is the Bucks repair. Originally it consisted of 4.5 millimeter stainless steel AO cortical lag screws, where basically you go right across the defect, and then you use um, aut autologous bone graft in the defect to try and get this to heal. In uh, the larger study uh, done out of England, 18 of 19 people returned to sport, and they had about a seven-month seven recovery before they were able to return to their sporting activities. There's also the uh, Morsher hook um, uh, screw. Uh, basically, you hook the, put the hook under the lamina and put the screw through the defect. Um, you can see what these x-rays look like uh, down here. Um, basically, with the hook under the lamina, the screw going across that defect uh, to try and uh, compress on that pars. You can see it's a partially threaded screw to try and get that compressed. In this large study out of Austria of 113 patients with 11-year follow-up, um, they developed a pseudarthrosis in 15 out of 113, um, uh, and all of, most of these were in the older people. So again, differentiating once again between the younger group of people and uh, those who are considered adults. Uh, despite those that had a pseudarthrosis, the symptoms improved in all. Uh, other techniques, uh, pedicle screws and hook, cruise, hook screw combinations. Um, again, you can see this individual here who presented uh, with a, a burst fracture. And if you look here, you can see that they have a spondylysis through here. So while the, the uh, burst fracture was being treated, we went and put some hooks underneath here without fusing the 5-1 segment to try and at least get that and use an iliac crest to, to place in that defect. Here's another one. Um, again, you can see that they have a PARS defect uh, back here in the back um, and a degenerative disc. So again, in this adult, I think the key thing is you're not really treating the spondylolysis. That is, not the, that is not the thing causing the pain in the adult. In the adolescent, yes, it can be causing the pain. In the adult, there's other things going on, and you're probably dealing more with a degenerative disc that may or may not be related or a spondylolisthesis that may or may not be related. So I think in conclusion, uh, surgery is rarely indicated for spondylolysis. Again, I think it's key to separate, differentiate between spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, and degenerative disc disease that all three may be occurring at the same time, but you're not really treating the spondylolysis. Occasionally in the adolescent, I think that's the case, but again, 80 to 90% of these will uh, heal without surgery. Um, in the adolescent, uh, direct repair may be indicated. You may not have to fuse it at all. You can use one of the above mentioned techniques. Um, in the adult, uh, fusion is probably the mainstay, um, but again, differentiating that you're not really treating the spondylolysis, you're treating the other things that accompany this. So thank you.
We'll ask our second guest of honor, Dr. Murray, to step up to the podium again and uh, educate us on how much surgery to do for spondylolisthesis. We've heard before that, um, again, more surgery may not be necessary, and uh, so maybe simple techniques may be as effective as more complex ones. Spartan Lumia. Okay, thank you, Jens. <coughs> when we face the spondylolisthesis, maybe we can consider two different conditions so-called pure spondylolisthesis, that is a, a degenerative spondylolisthesis, and in adults, the spondylo plus degenerative uh, changes. What I mean with this? Pure uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis is the de degenerative changes that affect a normal spine, create a segment instability, may have some relation with the facet orientation described by Glerber and um, Bodden, the slippage uh, in this uh, patient is usually less than 30%, almost never they get over the grade of 2. And generally, generally this is a slight, a slight or no progression. Condition 2 is where degenerative changes make symptomatic a silent ismic uh, spondylolisthesis. Why? Because maybe the degenerative uh, changes that affect the disc create an incompetent of this disc, a plastic posterior defect makes this uh, affected segmental unstable. In these cases, we may have important slippage from grade 3 to 5 to spondylolisthesis sometimes, and there's a tendency to progress. Let's take a look about in situ fusion, which are the pros for them. It's a less demanding technique, less transoperative bleeding, it's a less aggressive operation, with less neurological complication, satisfactory res results, and it is a reliable operation. <coughs> the cons, it's a post-op pers persistence of low back pain until uh, uh, L5, until uh, fusion is get. Sleep may progress up to 33% of the cases. Non-union is reported up to 40% of, of, of the cases. With the suboptimal, this is suboptimal spine biomechanical because we are not reconstructing the spine, the defect and with worse uh, cosmetic results. When we take a look about uh, in situ fusion, it's a low, uh, low rate of neurological complication. There's several uh, uh, publications that show that the high clinical success rates, several approach and techniques have been used, posterior, posterolateral, etc., with or without instrumentation. And uh, if we are doing, we are performing an in situ fusion, when neurological uh, symptoms is associated with pain, we need to add a decompression. The studies for this, Pick published in 89, eight adults with high-grade spondylolisthesis, no laminectomy, with uh, a high, 100% uh, good re pain relief and no pseudoatrosis. Lenke, uh, with a 55 each with no decompression instrumentation, uh, even though he got the 50% fusion rate, but clinical uh, improvement it was reported in 80% of his cases. Roca, in uh, 14 high-grade spondylolisthesis, first stage decompression and postural uh, interbody fusion, uh, shows complete neurological recovery in, uh, in all and excellent clinical results in 13 over 14 of his cases. Uh, for, for me and, and for my group, our choice procedure is in situ fusion. I would like to present this case. It's a 31 years old female with a progressive low back pain for uh, more than uh, five years, failure to conservative treatment, L5 pain in the last six months with some numbness in the, at the level of L5 bilaterally, no uh, motor deficit, and the EMG shows a bilateral moderate neuro neurological compromise. Always, as I, I mentioned, we perform this. Uh, uh, a study for determining what's uh, the bifurcation for not have a problem with this uh, vessel enemies. And this is the operation. We did a 300 axis T fusion with the femoral ring. This is a post-operative uh, uh, fusion. 